The most valuable optional OSPF configuration feature is to set the OSPF router ID. However, the rules are intricate. In this video, we'll work through all that detail. This video is the second in a set of three related videos, and it's totally about setting the OSPF router ID and how to configure that. Each of these three related videos also has a related review activity, so you see those over on the right. If you care about the exam, stick around to the end of this video and we'll do the usual three things. I'll talk about the official cert guides and how to best use this video with those for your studies. I'll tell everybody about how to do that review activity and where to find the related videos here on the channel to do that activity. And then one fun extra, in this case, there's a difference between Packet Tracer and Real Gear about OSPF router IDs. I'll go through that difference. All right, and by the way, thanks for all the support and help with my YouTube channel. You can do all the usual YouTube-y things that helps me succeed. Please do that. Keep doing it. Also, if you're ready to buy learning products for your CCNA journey, if you start with that link, that helps me as well. Thanks for your support. All right, let's dive in and talk about OSPF router IDs. First, let me tell you about the network we'll use in the examples in this video. So we've got four routers. They're each connected with a WAN link to two others, and each has a LAN interface. I'll show you the IP addresses on the interface because that matters a little to the configuration. Now, I'm going to focus over here on R1 and the examples, but you can think about the others as well. Additionally, I start with some assumed configuration on the routers, basically an OSPF process and the same network command on all four routers. So say if we look at the syntax, we've got an all zeros address and an all 255s wildcard. What does that mean? It means on all four routers, OSPF is enabled on all interfaces. That network command logic matches all interfaces, places them in area, area zero. So what do we have? All routers enabled for OSPF on all interfaces. So what is an OSPF router ID? It's a 32-bit number. Of course, we don't type or write them as 32 bits. We'll see them as dotted decimal numbers mostly. You can also see them represented as simply as a decimal number is calculated as a 32-bit value. Now, the numbers we choose to use must be unique mostly. So here are the rules. It must be unique for two routers to become neighbors with each other. They won't become neighbors if they use the same router ID. So that's an absolute. And they must be unique intra-area, meaning two routers that are in the same area, they can't use the same router ID value. However, you could have two routers that are in different areas duplicate and reuse the same area number, but there's really no benefit to it, all right? So um, it's useful to be unique inter-area, that is, between areas. Uh, so basically, if you run an OSPF in your company, make your router IDs unique. All right, so those are some of the rules. Now, here are a couple examples. Router R2, maybe its router ID is set to 2222. Router R4 is 4444. Why would we want to do that? Well, if you get, get this, if you could make a numbering plan for your OSPF router IDs so that it's easy to identify what router it is, well, certainly in a four-router lab, it's easy. But see how much easier it would be to interpret the output of the show IP OSPF neighbor command? This is one command. There are a lot of show commands for OSPF that display information based on router IDs. So it's easy for me to think, oh, that must be router four, that must be router two. Say you've got a thousand routers. Could you imagine a router ID numbering plan where you could think, oh, that's a router in this division and it's at branch office number 14, right? So you can play that kind of game with your numbering plan. A router's OSPF process uses a series of three rules to self-assign a router ID for itself. Here you see the rules. There's direct configuration. It's really obvious. Then there's a process that uses something called loopback interfaces, which we'll go through in some depth. And then the fallback, if you will, is this third option to look at all the existing interfaces and grab a router ID value, which is 32 bits long, from the IP addresses on any up and working normal interfaces. So let's walk through those in succession. We'll start with this direct configuration. So you could type a command router OSPF with the process ID to get into router configuration mode, and then simply type the router ID command with a number, which configures the router ID you want to use. Here it's got a dotted decimal number. It could be a 
just a plain decimal number without any dots in it as well. So in this case, the router ID that router R1 would use based on that first rule would be 1111. I'm going to skip rule two, 2 for now because rule 3 is easier to understand and helps us understand rule number 2. But if a router evaluates to find its router ID and there's no direct configuration at step 1 and there's no loopback interface, that's the part of step 2, then at step three, it looks for all its other interfaces, its non-loopback interfaces. They're in an upstate and says, hey, let me look at those and see um, what's up with them. So it looks at all three of its working interfaces. Say it's only got three up and working interfaces right now and considers those. And if you look around at those three IP addresses, clearly the bottom right one is the numerically highest IP address. So that's the router ID that R1 would choose in this case. Note that it's not the highest interface ID, it's the highest IP address on those up and working interfaces. The second rule has to do with something called loopback interfaces. So let me explain those here for a moment. So I've redrawn router R1, and I want this box to represent R1 because I'm going to look at internals in R1. So R1 has three physical interfaces that we've been working with, and we've configured IP addresses on those three physical interfaces. However, there are times when you want to have a virtual interface inside the router, and that's what a loopback interface is. And you can create that just by typing config commands. The loopback interfaces have an integer value to identify them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so I use 0 in this case. And by typing the interface loopback zero command, it creates an idea inside the software in the router, a loopback interface. And that loopback interface supports the configuration of IP addresses and masks. You can also use a shutdown and no shutdown command on the interface. Shutdown to administratively disable it, no shutdown to administratively enable it. So why is this important? Well, for the purposes of OSPF, Rule two says, if there are any of these in existence, I'll find them. And if they're up, that is, they're administratively enabled, in the case of loopback interfaces, I'll grab my router ID from the IP address on the loopback interface. In fact, if there are multiple loopback interfaces that are up, I'll grab the highest IP address amongst those. So yeah, that's a lot of rules. So to recap, the router ID command in router configuration mode, highest IP address on working loopback interfaces, and if that fails, highest IP address on all the other interfaces on the router. Imagine you're back at R1 and you did a show IP OSPF process command and you see this router ID. Now that router ID happens to also be an interface IP address. This is the router ID R1 would choose if it fell down to step three, rule three, about picking an interface's IP address. Now we get into configuration mode and configure the router ID command to give it router ID 1111. Now, if you're in config mode and you type these commands, we know those go into the running config file immediately. Now, if you repeated this show IP OSPF command, it would still have the old router ID in it. And if you did a copy running config startup config command to copy this new router ID command over to the startup config file, but repeated the show IP OSPF command, it would still show this old router ID. It wouldn't update yet. So there's something else that causes the router to reevaluate those three rules and choose a new router ID. And here they are. So basically, if you reload the operating system either via command or power off and on again, it brings up the OSPF software again and it reevaluates its choice of router ID then. So rules one and two for what triggers a, the choice of the router ID are pretty straightforward. Additionally, if a change occurs just because of the router ID command being reconfigured, then you can restart just the OSPF software in the router with the clear IP OSPF process command. Brings down OSPF, brings up OSPF, and that process will check the router ID command config, but not the other settings, not the loopbacks, not the interfaces, and make changes there. So that's one that's a little quirky. 
All right, so why in the world does Cisco want us to have routers that won't just go ahead and change the router ID? Well, it turns out changing the router ID is disruptive. For instance, imagine our four routers again, and these lines with circles represent neighbor relationships and say everything's converged and everybody's got routes. Well, certainly a reload or power off and on is going to be disruptive, but even that clear command that we just talked about, say on router R1, it would stop OSPF on router R1, and it would also break any neighbor relationships on R1, R2, R3, and R4, any routes that would otherwise have wanted to flow through R1, those would all be broken. It would be a big reconvergence event. So the design is we don't want that to happen just as a side effect of configuring an IP address somewhere. So the design instead is we want there to be some major triggering event before this reconsideration happens. Let's talk about the CCNA exam. If you're using the Cisco Press Cert Guides, a two-volume set, Look for Volume 1, Chapter 22. You'll find two major sections in that chapter, and we're talking about the first of those, which the title references the network command, but that's also where that book covers the router ID settings. So I made three videos related to that one section. This video is the second of those three, the OSPF router ID config video, if you will. So what do you do with the book having seen these videos? Well, if you watch all three of those instructional videos, you could safely skip that section of the book. The videos, three videos, are comprehensive to the book section. There are no must-read topics that I think you really ought to go read in the book. However, if you wanted to catch about a page on multi-area OSPF, it's not harmful. It's kind of a side topic in the book, though, to be honest. All right, how about a review activity? Well, I've got another config lab ready for you. You can go look at this link, open a tab, and go to that link right away. Each config lab page begins with a lab intro that has the topology and configurations and lab instructions that it asks you to do the lab in Cisco Packet Tracer. And then the page ends with a review of what I think you should have configured in the lab. If you'd like to use them, there's a lab intro and lab review video to match the upper and lower sections of the page. And the videos tend to dig a little deeper into the why, wherefore, if you want a little richer experience in lab. All right, finally, one small thing that's an extra that's a difference with Packet Tracer so it doesn't drive you crazy if you're using Packet Tracer to test. It turns out that routers, when you configure the router ID, require a reload or a power off on or a clear IP OSPF command. But Packet Tracer, as soon as you configure the router ID command, it immediately changes the router ID. All right, so just be warned when you use this command in lab or just testing, it's going to change the router ID immediately. Hope you enjoyed this video on OSPF router IDs. You know the drill with YouTube. Like, comment, share. Those are great ways to help me with the channel. Of course, welcome if you're new. Click subscribe and hear about new videos as they come out. I expect to continue to do those for a while. Hey, thanks for hanging out. I'll talk to you soon.